What's cracking, big dopes? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the dungeon. As you can see, uh, we are not in the HQ. We are not in the headquarters for our trade target video this week. Uh, that's because logistics are tough during the season, all right? We film Fade the Public on uh, Tuesday nights. I film with Noah on Tuesday afternoon, but I have something to do after our FTP filming, so I wanted to get back to New Jersey. Y'all don't give a shit. Y'all care about the trade targets. Uh, I will bring my webcam next time so you'll be able to see me in HD. We are also, also live streaming on Twitch right now. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you can follow us on Twitch. I don't know if they call them following. How, do you know what they do on Twitch? Like what they call it? No, I know you can like subscribe, maybe like a monthly subscription, more revenue. Ooh, we are always diversifying the revenue. So go hit us up on Twitch because we're going to be live streaming this episode behind the scenes before we set up and stuff, as well as obviously putting it up on YouTube. Our Twitch channel is Big Dogs Fantasy. Snacks, is that you? You creeping behind the wall over there? The door just like slowly opened up. I thought <laughs> it was going to be like in there. Um, so follow us on twitch.tv slash Big Dogs Fantasy. I will link that down below. For today's video, we're talking about top trade targets for week Three. I thought that was snacks creeping in over there. That's funny. Um, all right. So, Noah, welcome, welcome back. By the way, it's uh, I, I forgot you were here. I was just yelling and animals in the background. So, it's always good when you're in the contaminated dungeon. There's a lot of factors that go into play. So, I don't blame you at all. Yeah, I got a, I got a lot of outside noise happening right now. But we're gonna we're gonna focus in. We're gonna lock in, and we're gonna tell you who to trade for. Before we do that, hit the motherfucking thumbs up and hit the intro. All right, before we get into the first trade target of week three, make sure you smash that thumbs up button if you enjoy the video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. We are also uh, hitting you up on patreon.com slash BDG with private live streams, weekly rankings, all that stuff. Here's the first guy we're going to buy. First guy to buy, Allen Robinson, wide receiver, Chicago Bears. I know you wanted to sell him last week, but he's a buy low candidate for me. I mean, he had a monster week one. Trubisky only looked at Allen Robinson, but his production dipped off on Sunday. Caught just four or seven targets, 41 yards. It was bad. So was Mitch Trubisky. We already know that. But for more context, when you, when you dive a little bit deeper, you find out that Allen Robinson's seven targets was still 26% of Trubisky's 27 throws. He is still the basically the only guy catching passes there, the only guy getting valuable looks in that Chicago Bears offense. Is that even valuable? I mean, only time will tell. But it is the second consecutive week that Robinson has led the Bears in snaps, in routes run, in targets, in air yards. He's up to a 28% target share on the year and a 39% air yard market share. Again, he's the only guy that Trubisky is pushing the ball downfield to. Also, I think you can probably explain away the poor game on Sunday. You know, I, I keep, can keep going back to fucking Trubisky being terrible. But uh, Chris Harris was also shadowing. Allen Robinson in this one. That is a tough place to play up in Denver in that altitude against one of the league's best cornerbacks. But when you look at Allen Robinson's upcoming schedule, as you can see with the chart on the screen, people on Twitch have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about, but I promise it's up there if you go check it out on YouTube. Week three, Washington, Minnesota, Oakland, New Orleans, LAC. They have four home games after they play at Washington. If you look on the right side, Fantasy points allowed to wide receivers. Obviously, it is a very small sample size just through two weeks. But we're looking at Washington, the most points allowed to the wide receiver. Minnesota, ninth. Oakland, third. New Orleans, sixth. Uh, the Chargers are basically the only team outside of, like, the top. They're still in the top half, but they're outside the of the top. Chargers are dead. I, I wouldn't even care about them. They've lost everything in the secondary at this point. Yeah, exactly. Their safeties are all dead. And uh, you look at the rest of the teams, and they have all been – beaten up and if you want to you know talk about Minnesota Xavier Rhodes he is not the Xavier Rhodes that we've gotten used to this New Orleans team is obviously going to be a lot less powerful without Drew Brees even on the defensive side of the ball so when you look at the schedule when you look at just how involved Allen Robinson has been in this offense like I think he's the perfect buy low candidate coming off a shitty week so Allen Robinson is someone I'm going to be sending out some trade offers for uh probably tonight yeah, I think the fact that we brought him up last week and kind of said he was a guy you could sell high, and now he's after like a terrible performance where like a good chunk of his yards came in the very last play of the game where they got that field goal. Yeah. Um, 
like people are kind of thinking, as I thought last week, oh, he's the next Corey Davis. He's going to see all these targets. But what does that really mean on Chicago? Well, they really don't have a second receiver there. I mean, Tariq Cohen is basically their slot receiver at this point, and he wasn't on the field nearly as much this past week as the week before. So even if he is, like, their solidified one in an offense that's not that good, that's still going to be, like, in and around 10 targets a game. And if you're not going to be paying, like, premium, like, high-end wide receiver two price for him, a guy with that type of volume, you're just going to keep buying because even if the efficiency is the, isn't there, I mean, we look at a guy like Jarvis Landry last year. He was awful, yet he still finished as, I think, a top 24 receiver just because he was peppered with targets. And you could, uh, you could expect a lot of the same this year out of uh, Allen Robinson in Chicago. Yes, sir. Buy a Rob. The A Rob money. The guy that I'm selling is actually on an offense that has looked absolutely incredible. And he's a running back, and he goes by the name of James White. And the reason for this is not only Antonio Brown coming in and, like, I don't even know if this guy's going to be on the team in a few weeks after he's just been, like, farting in people's faces, like, all day. Do you see those stories about him? No. You didn't see that? Wait, who is this? Who, Antonio, Antonio Brown. Brown. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a little bit more concerned about him raping women, not farting on people. That's fair. <laughs> the doctor, there's, like, a doctor, and he's like, yeah, I feel super disrespected when he just farts in my face, and he's being sued for, like, $1,000 or $11,000. I respect him more now. You didn't see the video either? No. You were missing I out. I don't have time for these fucking childish games, Noah. Like, I got, I got things to do. I know you're in your fucking bunk bedroom over there watching <laughs> Antonio Brown fucking fart. <laughs> That's not even my bed. Come on now. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So, if Antonio Brown – oh, shit. The turnover chain is on. Now we're serious, yeah. <laughs> uh, Antonio Brown, if he's going to remain on this team, which I kind of it kind of looks like it since he's really gotten no, like, rep- repercussions thus far. Um, that's just another mouth to feed. He's only played 24 of the snaps last week, and he saw eight targets. So basically a third of the time he was out there, the ball was going his way. Not only that, Rex Burkett has actually been a very big part of this offense. He's only played six less snaps than James White, but he's outgained him 153 yards to 111. He's outtouched him 20 to 15 times, and he only has one less target. And I'm going to put up the splits on the screen, not for Twitch because, you know, it's live and all that stuff, but uh, the splits last year with and with <laughs> the splits last year with and without uh, Rex Burkhead in the lineup, right? He was six and a half points per game worse with him, and I know he still put up pretty good numbers. But all things considered, last year, right? James or Josh Gordon was entering the season a little bit banged up, and he was like an addition halfway through the season. Uh, Julian Edelman was suspended. Rob Gronkowski was a shell of himself. Sony Michelle and then Rex Burkhead they ended up getting injured, so it was basically his entire job was to just get volume. And that's what we expected a little bit out of him in the beginning of this season before we knew Josh Gordon was going to be there and before Antonio Brown came into town. And now that the volume isn't guaranteed, I'm not sure you can trust him as an RB2 in anything other than a full PPR format. And the fact that he scored a touchdown last week uh, leads me to believe you can probably sell him for like a back-end RB2 price, which I wouldn't be opposed to selling at this point. Yeah, I mean, we want to talk about how New England Patriots' fantasy defense is literally going to win the next five weeks for their owners. Like, they, I mean, you have to think of that conversely with James White like they play the Jets the Bills the Redskins the Giants the Jets the Browns like those are six games in which the Patriots are going to be extremely heavily favored and you know it doesn't always work out to the to the way that if one and one equals two here it's usually never that case when you think it's oh it's a Sony Michelle game James White isn't going to produce um but you know just using common sense and logic like when the when the Patriots get up 46 to nothing against the Jets next week there's not really going to be a, a place for Tom Brady and James White to, you know, have that little connection that they got going on. And I feel like that's going to be the case for the next, you know, five, six weeks um, of the season. So James White just seems like a guy whose volume is definitely going to dip off. And I'd rather go towards the volume um, avenue than an efficiency avenue for a guy like uh, James White and at the running back position. Yeah. And last week, just looking at like how he scored his points, he didn't get a target until I think like two minutes left in the first half. And his touchdown came like right before the two minute warning. It was like in garbage time. So it's not like he was being heavily involved in the game. And I think that's just a sign of things to come for him the rest of the season. Yeah. We off James White. We always have been. I mean, we'll be telling you to trade James White in, into like week 13 when he's already put up like RB1 numbers. The deadline is over. Yeah. Get him the hell still out of here. Still sell high. Still sell high. RB1. Eric Henry, get him out of here. Yeah, exactly. We're going to just keep being wrong about that one. No, <laughs> on the real, though, Derrick Henry's not on this list. He was on the list last week for sell high. He also, like, I understand he, he went off for, like, 17 PPR fantasy points or whatever in this one. But they keep getting, like, PI penalties called on, in, in the end zone as well. So they keep setting him up on the one-yard line. And I think this offense will eventually expose itself and those lucky things that are keep 
are, are keeping Derrick Henry atop the fantasy running back list are eventually going to run out and, uh, and sell the fuck out of Derrick Henry now. <laughs> speaking, speaking of being exposed, do you see that screen pass they drew up for him last week? Yeah. I fucking did you see the he jumped video? up and he like clapped his hands. He just yeah, go look at go look at my Twitter. I uh, I videotaped it like I was watching it on Game Pass and I took a video of it with my phone and then I added animal. Yeah. I, I responded. I said if you averaged that out with last week's oh, one, yeah, yeah. thirty seven yards a catch. So. Hey man, numbers, analytics, they don't lie. All right, move on to the next guy. Who you like, who you hate. I gotta save my my second guy for uh, for the end because I don't feel I don't feel right putting him in the middle. He needs like his own section. Yeah. Uh, well, we got Mike Williams right now of the Los Angeles Chargers, and he's actually coming to buy a low on. Going into the season, I wasn't high on him at all, and it's because I wasn't like sure exactly what his role was going to be. Yo, he's looked good. He's he, looked fucking good. I Coming out of college, when he got drafted, I think it was sixth or seventh overall, I was so pissed because I love Tyrell Williams, and he that was like the year I think yeah. he came off of like such a great season. And, you know, I wasn't like too convinced that he was going to be good, but he's like surprisingly fast. He has a crazy vertical. And in a game where he was supposed to be limited, they used him in the red zone a ton. I know that's what they said yeah. uh, they were going to do. But in the deep game, too, he made that 47-yard catch, and he just went, like, full extension and, like, basically jumped over a safety. Like, yeah, that was a beautiful catch. Yeah, and him getting, like, the snaps he did, I think it was, like, 61%, despite being limited, and now Hunter Henry is out. That either tells me his role is either going to increase because Hunter Henry's out, or he's not really as injured as we thought he was, which are both good signs for him. And another thing to consider is – you know, behind Keenan Allen and Austin Eckler, they don't have, like, a solidified receiving option. They have, like, Dontrell Inman, who took away, like, a like a 70-yard touchdown from Justin Jackson. I was so mad about that. But, uh, <laughs> like, they have him. They have Travis Benjamin, who hasn't been good since, like, week two when he was on the Browns five years ago. Like, other than those two guys, uh, Keenan Allen, who has, like, a 56% market share of the air yards, um, behind that, they really have nothing else in this receiving game. And Mike Williams is, by far and away, their biggest receiver. He's going to be using the red zone, and that was evident last week um, despite that knee injury. And they drew up a few plays for him, right? He, he dropped one, and then one was broken up. But that just shows the confidence that Phil Rivers has because, as we all know, he likes to lean on his tight end in the red zone. And Mike Williams is basically that for him right now because all they have is Virgil Green and a couple of guys I don't even know the names of that are just out there to block. So the volume is going to be there. And even if you look at his schedule coming up, like the only tough games he really gets are like Chicago is going to be tough, Tennessee is going to be tough, Jacksonville, I don't even know anymore because Jalen Ramsey might not be on this team. And A.J. Boye doesn't really have the athleticism or, like, the size to guard him. Um, and maybe the Vikings, but, like, Xavier Rhodes, too. And also, like, Keenan Allen plays in the slot a lot, so he's not always getting, like, the number one corner because they don't – most of the time don't travel in there. So it wouldn't be fair to say Mike Williams would get, be getting the second corner all the time. But he's going to be getting targets deep down the field. He's going to be getting targets in the end zone. And he's just going to have volume, volume overall. And in a good offense, that's what you're going to chase in fantasy. And the fact that he hasn't had, like, a breakout performance thus far is, uh, like, a prime time to buy him right now. Yeah, him uh, along with Will Fuller of the Houston Texans. I know we have him listed here. Now, Fuller is yet to have a breakout game, um, but he has looked like – I mean, he's he's clearly the number two, and he looks, you know, basically 100% healthy. Um, what is up with modern medicine? Like, these guys just tear their ACLs and they're back in two weeks. Yeah, it's actually fucking out of control. I mean, we're going to have to – re-diagnose this whole uh, the whole fantasy situation with Dr. Morse next offseason but yeah there's a lot of guys coming back strong wide receivers torn ACL Will Fuller is getting a lot of deep passes um, I was looking and of wide receivers that have received I believe it was like at minimum eight targets Will Fuller has the highest rate of his targets being deep balls uh, I believe 50 percent of all of his targets have been deep balls Obviously, it's only a matter of time before those start to connect. Now, it's kind of a little bit discouraging that we haven't seen them get more of like an intermediate or short game going between Will Fuller and Deshaun Watson because you'd like to see him kind of take a step up as like the real wide receiver too, one that you can trust on to maybe get eight to nine targets a game instead of like five and, you know, three of them or two of them being uh, deep balls. But the key point here is that Will Fuller looks healthy. Will Fuller is extremely talented. He has – Cured, for the most part, his biggest issue coming out of college, which was drops. Um, he's making ridiculous plays down the field. And he's operating as a clear number two. So um, it's only a matter of time, again, before that, those opportunities turn to production. That's what you want to capitalize on, especially early in the season. When the, when the sample size is so small, when it's just two games, you want to look at what the opportunity is. Because the opportunity almost always converts into production. And that's what we have here. So small sample size by 
um, get, you know, a, a couple fluky games in which the production didn't match the opportunity will eventually turn his course and flip. And, it, you know, I'd be worried if, you know, they had Kiki QT coming back and will uh, Kenny Stills was starting to eat into like Will Fuller's workload. Right. And those guys were getting 50% and 45%. Will Fuller's snap count went down from 85 to, you know, 65 or something. Then we'd have something to look at, but Will Fuller's still playing as the main wide receiver two there. He's getting the looks. Um, so it's only a matter of time again before he busts out. Yeah, his Snapchat over the past two weeks has been 97% and 91%. And as you said, that's like really good to see, especially like they brought in Kenny Stills, who kind of has a redundant skill set. He's obviously not the same player Will Fuller is, but it's good to see him be out on the field, even with these other weapons playing out there and just building on like the volume he's getting in the deep game. He has the fourth most deep targets with six. He has the most catchable deep balls with four. So not only is he getting volume, he's getting good volume, volume that he can actually capitalize on. And his market share of air yards doesn't look too great. It's 24th. But keep in mind they have Deshaun, or not Deshaun Watson, DeAndre Hopkins, who is taking up a big chunk of that. So when you look at his just raw air yards in total, he is the 11th most in the league. So he's being used heavily down the field, which is kind of what we all knew. But it at least is promising knowing that coming off this ACL, he's back close to 100%. And he's being used in the role that we all wanted him to like have. And Nick, I'm going to a little trivia here. Guess what his average depth of target is right now? 24.3 yards. Well, that's why they pay you the big bucks. That is, that is in fact, the exact number. It's just, it's just so promising for, to see a guy like this who has been so good on these deep targets throughout his entire career being used in this fashion of the game. And, you know, eventually we're going to see him capitalize. Like the last game, there was a 50-yard bomb that, like, went through his hands because it was, it was decent coverage. But he had his man beat. It was just it was yeah. at the last second. Another one, he made, like, a great catch down the sideline. So, He's back. He's ready to produce, and it's only going to take a few more games. And as we already touched on, you know, Jacksonville is probably their, one of their toughest matchups in division. If Jalen Ramsey is out and they're going to put A.J. Boye on Hopkins, who are they going to have to cover him? Like, he's just going to burn the defense deep, and, you know, that's just going to be – all hell is going to break loose once Will Fuller becomes the Will Fuller we've come to love over the past couple of years. Yeah, I think uh, Terry McLaurin is basically what we wanted Will Fuller to be. And it's sad to see, but – I think uh, those roles will flip eventually. And we're going to see some big games out of Will Fuller. Now, the last guy up on this list, and I'll be honest, this one, this one hurts to say a little bit, and I would be totally comfortable with y'all fading the shit out of me on this one. It's Nick Chubb of the Cleveland Browns. Now, Chubb's been fine, right? He's been good. He's been that low-end RB1 that you drafted him for. But if there's going to be a best time to hit the market for Chubb and still be able to sell at a premier value – it would be right now. And I, I don't think he's going to fall off. I still think he's going to be, you know, that borderline RB1, possibly high-end RB2 to go forward. But if you drafted him as a first-round pick, you're probably not getting value back compared to the other running backs that went in the same – well, maybe not like – I feel like any of the running backs that went at that back half of the first round are really busting right now. Connor, uh, Mixon, uh, Chubb's been doing better than them. But I think uh, – what. What we're looking at right here for Chubb and the Cleveland Browns, I see multiple red flags going forward. One is you just look at Cleveland, and I think we just have to acknowledge as football fans that Cleveland and their offense is not going to be anything near what like the media and we had hyped them up to be this preseason, right? They are not polished. They are not well put together like we had hoped they would be. Um, and they, honestly, they barely deserved to win that game against the Jets the other night. I know it ended up being a blowout, but like, they they didn't deserve their offense did not deserve that um, their defense was obviously lights out but I mean they're going against fucking Trevor Simeon and, and Luke Folk so that the offense is a mess right Baker it's, it feels like he's letting every single play play clock run down to one second and like barely getting the snap off and it's happening consistently over and over and over again they have no rhythm Freddie Kitchens is calling some miserable plays in my opinion but the other like the real tangible takeaways and the real tangible red flags are this like they lose Kevin Zeitler this off season. And, you know, some, some people are like, yeah, that's going to be a big hit that offensive line. I was of the, the mind set that Baker was good enough to make that, to elevate that team to where the offensive line is obviously matters, but not that much. And so is Nick Chubb was talented enough to elevate the team or elevate himself to the point where he's a, still going to be a fantasy stud, but you're going to see, you're seeing like the holes are not very big there. He's not getting a lot of running room. And even as someone as talented and as big and as strong and as fast as he is, it's still going to hurt him a lot, right? Because a lot of the times when he'd be running for six or eight yards on a normal play, that's just a two or three yard run. And after, you know, 17 carries, he gets a lot of volume there. Those add up to an extra 40 or 50 rushing yards per game. Um, right now they're ranking 19th in run blocking per PFF. The other big, the, the other big scare here for Chubb is the amount of times he's coming off the field, right? Chubb has played so far on 67% of the Browns offensive snaps. So he's almost giving away 35% 
of snaps to a combination of Dontrell Hilliard and Dearness Johnson, which is not what you want to see from your first round fantasy pick. You want that guy on the field for 85 to 90 percent of the snaps. Um, the silver lining is that Chubb is still running a lot of routes. He's still running more routes than the other two, but he's not getting that much more pass catching work than them. He has seven catches through two games, which is great, but those guys are on the field constantly. Uh, he's being taken off the field on almost every third down and almost every two minute drill. He's not the guy they're going to use on the field for that. And that is a, that is a big, a big, 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 big red flag. Um, and then you look at the schedule for the remainder of like the next month or month and a half. They play the Rams. They play at Baltimore, at San Fran, who is a much improved defense. Seattle, who is a bad pass defense this year, but a very good run defense. Then they get a bye. Then they're at New England. They're at Denver, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, who is another really good run defense. So, you know, you're looking at Chubb. He's still an RB1, like I said. Um, but I still think you could sell him right now for the price of an RB1. So if you get him in the second or third round, if you got him in the second or third round, then he's probably still a good value for you, and maybe you should keep him. But if you could sell him for around the price that you drafted him for, I would probably look to do so. Yeah, last night's game, or like two days ago when you guys see this, that's a game where he should have seen like, I know it's hyperbole, but like 30, like 30 rushes, 200 yards, and like five touchdowns. I mean, you're not going to see a better game script than yeah. the one they had. They so, didn't but. have like Quinn and Williams out there. They had no starting quarterback. They were down to Luke Falk. That should have been a game where they were in the red zone 10 times. And yeah, not that didn't win, man. Yeah, they couldn't get in there. De'Aaron is Johnson, as you said, is still taking snaps. And even in the first week of the year, uh, Dontrell Hilliard, like, vultured a touchdown from Nick Chubb on the goal line. So this just isn't, like, an op- he's not getting the opportunities you would want out of a guy you probably spent the first-round capital on. And I definitely wouldn't hate moving him for, like, a high-end receiver. Um, maybe even, like, buying low on a guy like Juju Smith-Schuster and then another piece just because Chubb is coming off of a good game. And people are really off on, like, Juju and Michael Thomas because of, quarterback changes even though they're still the number one on their team and they're working like in a short and intermediate game so then how, how about this Nick Chubb for Alvin Kamara what side do you take I'm taking Alvin Kamara because yeah. we know he's gonna get pass down work yeah I like Kamara because again it's only gonna be six weeks and two of those two of those games are pretty easy on the schedule obviously you have to weather the storm for a little bit but by the time Breeze is back and Kamara is back to himself we don't know what the Chubb like workload is gonna be I just I, I all summer I was pretty sh- pretty set and he he is seeing the passing game work a little bit but like those two minute drills in the fourth quarter and the third downs and stuff that that's so valuable in fantasy man and if Chubb's not going to see that that's going to show out over his season-long production which is what really scares me yeah I remember when Kareem Hunt was a rookie in Kansas City they would do the same thing between him and like Chuck Hendrick West and like it doesn't seem like it hurts a lot but when those two minute drives like culminate into touchdowns at the end of the quarter you're going to be like, oh, shit, if he was out there, that would be an extra six points for me. And you don't really, like, realize it until the end of the game when he underperforms, and that's just going to be the case for Nick Chubb this year if he's not going to be on the field as much as we had hoped, like, where you had drafted him for. Yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little bit nervous as a Nick Chubb owner. In, our, uh, in the BDG team league, he was, my, he was my 106 because we had that 100 yard from scrimmage bonus. And actually, it's only an extra point and a half, but, like, that's still what I was targeting for a lot of the guys that I drafted – and he's having trouble hit 100, hitting 100 yards because he's not getting enough work overall. And he's not – it's like the efficiency is not there. I mean, the volume is still good. He's seen, I think, 18 carries and then 17 carries. But, like, I had suspected him to be somebody who was getting 22 carries, 25 carries. Again, like in a game last night where they were just dominating the Jets. Like, if not then, then when is it going to happen? Because we don't know. And, and just, like, Baker doesn't look good either, and he's not running the offense well. Yeah, and it's a tough division. Like the Steelers have one of the best run block or run defensive units in the league, and they also play Baltimore, whose offense has looked incredible, and they still have a good defensive front. So it's not like they're going to have the luxury to just run the ball all game. And those are four games this season where, like, you, there's those are games you're not going to have confidence starting Nick Chubb, despite him being like the guy you picked in the first round. So move him while you can, because like I wouldn't say it's like urgent that you have to move him, just because so many running backs are not really living up to the hype, as you said. Like James Conner's hurt now. Joe Mixon's been terrible, but. If you can get value where you think you're like obviously winning the trade just because you're trading him off the back of uh, that Monday night football game where everybody was watching and he did look very good, um, I, I would totally do it. And I don't know if you want to t- touch on guys like Juju and Michael Thomas and stuff like that, but would you buy if people are trying to sell them for low prices? Because I've been seeing like wild trades. Um, so I'm not going to – Juju is not a guy I'm buying. For the most part, if I own them, I'm probably just going to hold them and see what happens. Uh, they're also not guys I'm actively looking to buy from players. 
Uh, I think a better question, it, it's really hard to just say like, would I buy or sell? Because every trade is so specific to your team and what you're going to be offered or offering. So I think something better to do would be like, who do you think? Okay, so we'll go Juju, James Conner, Kamara, Michael Thomas. Were there any other big? Like Joe Mixon, but he's not hurt, and that's not tethered to a quarterback. Yeah, let's go with these injuries. Let's say Cam Newton's out for a long period of time. Christian McCaffrey. Let's let let's put those in order of who loses the most value. I would say, I would put James Conner number one. I was going to say the two Steelers are definitely one and two for me. I would probably put James Conner just because he needs game script. He needs twenty carries a game to be an RB one. Um, so I'd be James Conner, Juju. Uh, I Kamara. might say Kamara because like the touches, like at least we know McCaffrey's gonna get the touches. Kamara needs those touchdowns as well, which is why we were drafting him so high. And if that offense doesn't take an efficiency hit and they're not in the red zone as much. Like, that really lowers his ceiling. Yeah, my, my debate was between Kamara and Michael Thomas. To be honest with you, it, with Christian McCaffrey, it's it like – it's almost in a fucking increase in value. Like Cam, <laughs> I, Cam's been so bad, and these backup quarterbacks – like, we look, we saw down the stretch last year when Cam was out, Christian McCaffrey started getting, like, 15 fucking targets a game. Last year, I looked at his stats. The one full game when uh, Cam Newton was out, and because the last game of the season, Christian McCaffrey barely played, he had yeah. 178 yards from scrimmage. He had 13 targets, and he had 33 touches. And that's yeah. just what they're going to do. They're going to lean on him, and he's going to get all the volume. So I don't think it hurts him at all. I think, like, if anything, it could just keep him, like, streamlined where he is right now. Yeah, I, w- I have Christian McCaffrey in one of my leagues, and I was so pumped that he fell to me at the 103 because I was like – that was after we heard about Cam Newton's foot injury. And I was like, this is perfect. Like, I almost want Cam to be out in this time because Christian McCaffrey is going to get so many dump-offs from these backup quarterbacks. It's going to be Kyle Allen back there, and they played together last year. So we saw what came of that. So Christian McCaffrey – Stays the same no matter what happens to Cam. Um, yeah, between Michael Thomas and Alvin Kamara, I think – I talked about this in my video today. I don't think Michael Thomas really takes that big of a hit because what happens is, like, Teddy Bridgewater is not a guy that throws the ball downfield. He's not a prolific passer. But Michael Thomas, at this point, is not someone who gets deep targets anyways. Like, Drew Brees hits him on the intermediate and short routes. And he catches everything in his path. So he's still going to get 10 to 12 targets a game and probably catch eight to nine balls a game. Um, a few of them might be a little bit more inaccurate, obviously. But what this hurts the most is, you know, Drew Brees is so good in the screen game with Alvin Kamara. And, you know, it just doesn't open up uh, as many holes because now they can kind of key in on on just two players in their offense. And I think overall it hurts Kamara a little bit more. But I'm not, you know, I'm not selling Kamara on the low because I think, you know, Brees will be back, obviously, and Kamara will be fine for the fantasy playoffs, uh, assuming you make it there. But that that's how I would order. I would say James Conner, Juju, Alvin Kamara, Michael Thomas, Christian McCaffrey in terms of whose value is hurt from most to least with these injuries. Yeah, I agree with that. And just keep in mind, Teddy Bridgewater has that Vikings connection with Latavius Murray. So we could see a little uptick there. A little fake news spreading seeds, you know. Um, Speaking of incredibly big news, C.J. Anderson was just released by the Detroit Lions. Poor one out for the meatball. (laughs) Oh, C.J. Anderson? Yeah, who do you think I said? I I thought you said like D.J. I thought it was just some random guy. David Johnson has been released. <laughs> I <don't know>. Cardinal. <laughs> His I wrist is not holding up. <laughs> yeah, so C.J. Anderson, so off Detroit, didn't matter. Obviously, we could – that wasn't hard to see coming given that Ty Johnson – Just like Patricia back there, and it would be like a redundant skill set to C.J. Anderson. <laughs> That's facts. He's probably ready to fucking roll out there. He's like, we need to get – We need to get <laughs> six, roll out there. six running – Yeah, <laughs> we need to get six running backs into, into the committee. Karen Johnson, you look – you look fantastic. Enough of that. Get off the field. Yeah, get the hell out of here. You helped That's us all we got for today. Out of here. What? I said you helped us beat the Chargers. Get the hell out of here. Yeah, exactly. So anything that is a negative detriment to the Detroit Lions is probably a good start in your fantasy lineups. But don't start C.J. Anderson this week. Ty Johnson is a good pickup in Dynasty Leagues if he's somehow still available for y'all. That's all we got for you today. If you enjoyed the video, as always, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Smash the subscribe button if you are new. Join us on Twitch next Tuesday. We'll try to do this around four to five. What are you fucking smirking at over Dude, there? Dude, I just opened up Twitch and I'm just reading all Yannick's comments. He said, is anybody else worried about Noah falling out of his bed? <laughs> um, yeah, so follow us on Twitch. It's twitch.tv slash big dog fantasy every Tuesday between 4 and 5 p.m. Eastern time. We will be doing this video. You could also join us on Patreon where you will get my weekly waiver wire article, which is exclusive to Patreon, weekly rankings, access to a private community forum in which myself, Noah, Animal, and Snacks are extremely engaged on and uh, our private weekly live stream every Saturday afternoon. That's all we got for today. I'm out.
goodbye.